Excellencies, I don't know if the Greek ambassador is here still, distinguished members of the Australian, the American, and the British committees, ladies and gentlemen, dear Emmanuel, dear David, but dear Russell. My God, what a, what a, uh, a position to speak after you, because I'd like so much to link to what you just said, and I really appreciate uh, and I think this is what will change the attitude. I unfortunately will have to go a bit back so as to come back to you and join you in your thoughts. So ladies and gentlemen, it is an, indeed an honor and a real pleasure to be amongst you today. And I would like to thank the organizing committee of the colloquium for giving me this opportunity to be in Sydney and discuss with you the issue that is so close to our hearts. I would also like to thank my government, the Cypriot government, for enabling me to be here today. I chose to name my brief presentation Why the Truth Matters, because I think that even today, as the Greek government is exploring a solution through the UNESCO mediation process, there is a sort of a cat and mouse play between the two or the three interested parties, that is Greece, the British government, and of course the British Museum. It is only in 1982 and through the loud and sensuous voice of Melina Mercuri that the world became really aware of what the Parthenon marbles meant to Greece first and then of course to Western civilization. I, I excuse for the bad quality of my photographs but they come from the film. Addressing the British in London she said, you must understand what the Parthenon marbles mean to us. They are our pride, they are our sacrifices, they, she said a lot, and then she ended by saying, they are the essence of Hellenes. That was the decisive moment when the Parthenon became an international issue. Now, how did Melina achieve this? She faced and challenged the British in Britain, in the British Museum, in the Duveen Gallery, in front of the marbles. It was her powerful wording that mobilized international public opinion. She made our claim known to the world and to international organizations, foundations, archaeologists, intellectuals, scientists, politicians, and simple citizens became aware and supported what, what was to become an international claim and not only a Greek one. She didn't prevaricate. She went straight to the point. She asked for their return, all of them, to where they belonged. Today, we strive to continue her legacy. We campaign, but we often use different, less powerful wording, maybe indicative of our ambivalence and the mixed schools of thought for the return of the marbles. Campaigns in recent years often use the word, we want them back. I really don't think the British Museum cares of what we want. Our wording should be directed to what the British government museum should do and not to what we want. And who's we? Unfortunately, in my eyes, we mirrors the Greek. And we know that our public image has been unfairly and unjustly, unjustly tormented during these last years. Give them back should be our motto, or even clearer, send them back to Athens. And not send them, send the marbles back to Athens. The campaign of the American committee used the word missing in 1801. The sculptures Morosini tried to steal and unfortunately dropped on the floor, they're still missing as well. The marbles are not missing since 1801. They have been stolen. So I would say stolen since 1801. This is how Melina would have said it anyway. And this is why her wording had an impact. Our campaigns hardly, it's very unfortunate, step public opinion. They mostly leave the media unaffected, impassive, and maybe uninterested. We don't create news, and we don't hit the front pages, because the media 
the public opinion, and consequently the world, need something more explicit. I personally feel that there are two negative issues that should be discussed among the people who really care about the Parthenon and the reunification. They both have to do with truth and honesty on our behalf. The first being this increasingly fragmented approach to the campaign for the reunification. And secondly, the absence of determination and resolve on our behalf to face and challenge the British. I have an ill feeling that we're fighting for something which is almost impossible to achieve. And this is something we have to discuss about. Having said this, I would like to quote what Tom Flynn wrote to us all a couple of weeks ago regarding this matter. I quote, the implicit irony of a fragmented campaign seeking the reunification of a fragmented world monument must be only too apparent to the British Museum and to other opponents of the reunification. In my paper, I will argue that if we want to succeed and bring back the marbles, our attitude has to change. And we have to look the British in the eye, not as an imperial nation anymore, who undertakes to, quote, save and protect, unquote, cultural heritage from the natives, but as a modern European country that has to respect human rights, laws and ethics, not necessarily through complex, complex court cases and litigation as we know and understand the drawbacks and the dangers of, of, of such a proposition for Greece and the marbles, but through campaigns that tell the truth and unveil and expose the arrogance and the egotism of the British authorities. People are, curiously enough, still interested in the long-lasting issue of the Parthenon marbles, and the reason behind their interest is the fact that the Athenian request to Britain represents and stands out for human rights, world justice, morality, and ethics. We need to state overtly and officially so as to convince the world that Lord Elgin's theft was the most ignoble act of the neoclassical era, and spread to the planet what Henry Porter recently said, that there is a moral imperative to try to right the wrongs past. British people, not the British government, and of course not the British Museum, have stood by the request for the reunification of the marbles since the beginning. During the 19th and 20th centuries, British people have shown that they do not share the views of the British government and the British Museum. I will go a bit into history to show you that we have arguments that we have never used. The demand for the return of the sculptures begins already in the 19th century, before even the British Parliament decided the acquisition of the marks. During the common debate of February 1816, the majority of the members of Parliament questioned the appropriation of the sculptures. Quote, whether an ambassador residing in the territories of a foreign power should have the right of appropriating to himself and deriving benefits from objects belonging to that power, or, quote, the mode in which the collection has been acquired partook of the nature of spoliation, or again, the demand from the NPs to ascertain whether this collection had been procured by means such as were honourable to the grand British uh, country. On June 7th, 1816, while the House was sitting as a committee of supply, Mr. Hugh Hammersley made the first recorded proposal for the return of the marbles. And I cannot resist but read Emmanuel had already mentioned it beforehand, the proposed amendment he made. He said, quote, a communication should immediately be made stating that Great Britain hold these marbles 
only in trust till they are demanded, listen to this ladies and gentlemen, till they are demanded by the present or any future possessors of the city of Athens. And upon such demand, engages without question or negotiation to restore them as far as, as can be affected to the places from whence they were taken, and that they shall be in the meantime carefully preserved in the British Museum. What a statement which has hardly ever been used. Throughout the 20th century, this is where I come to my friend Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, efforts have been made by nearly every Greek government without really any visible outcome. When Athens staged the Olympic Games in 2004 and when the New Acropolis Museum opened in 2009, the British Museum faced pressure to return the sculptures to Greece. Public pressure, intellectuals, elected officials and ordinary citizens, uh, citizens weighed in, with public opinion apparently in favour of giving them back. But rightly said by Fiona Rose Greenland, quote, this issue bubbles up every few years. It follows a predictable pattern. An event, can be a speech, a historical landmark in a new building, triggers renewed cries for repatriation, media outlets swarm around the, of the story, and the British Museum digs in its heels. Why is it that the issue is apparently irresolvable? And how did these sculptured rocks made by non-British artisans in a non-British place come to be seen as integral to the British Museum and implicitly to, the, to Britain generally? Close quote. The answer is not an easy one. Some talk of nationalism, others refer to colonialism, egotism and arrogance. However one sees the issue, the only certainty is that there has been no substantial move on behalf of the British government. And let's think about the last statement of PM Cameron confirming the adamant position. Nor have the British Museum ever, ever moved on this issue. Christopher Hitchens rightly notes, can we continue to justify an act, which is the amputation of sculpture from a temple? Are there any standards apart from national egoism or entrepreneurial reach that, can go that should govern the, the apportionment of cultural property? The issue was back in the public agenda in 2012 in a repatriation debate between Stephen Fry and MP Tristan Hunt, who said, quote, the Greek people should have intense pride that the Parthenon marble sit in the midst of the British Museum. Enlightenment, civilization, and cosmopolitanism demand that the marbles should remain in the British Museum, available to all the world. Remain true to the marbles, keep them here. On October 15th, this is from Stephen Fry. On October 15th, the Swiss Committee for the Restitution of the Parliament Sculptures held a roundtable discussion at the European Parliament, stressing that the unification of the Parthenon marbles should be a European concern. Art historian Tom Flynn, who was amongst the speakers, said, quote, what can we say about the case for reunifying re re the Parthenon marbles that has not been said a thousand times before? What more can we add to the numerous persuasive arguments already made for reuniting the dismembered components of Phidias' finest achievement? How many more times must we convene to reiterate the importance of restoring coherence to a work of art whose desecration at the hands of Lord Elgin damaged one of Greece's greatest gifts to the world? The well known journalist and author <coughs> Henry Porter, also a speaker at the round table, commends his speech by saying The Parthenon marbles were sculpted in the 5th century in Greece and stolen from there by Lord Elgin in the early 19th century. They are kept in the British Museum. He concluded his speech pointing out that the returning of the sculptures would be the right thing to do. The key word Henry Porter used was stolen. People understand this word and it is universally accepted that law punishes theft. Porter spoke the truth and this is why the truth matters. A project devoted to culture and the fine arts became an enterprise an undertaking, and finally, an opportunistic acquisition. We need to show the world that these stones, 
of no great value, I'm sure you all know who said that. Commissioned and executed nearly 2,500 years ago have meanings for all mankind, but they also lie at the core of Greek identity and self-esteem. Melina made a difference because she faced the issue bluntly, because in her own unique way, but that was the only positive outcome we have ever had. She didn't talk about lending, she didn't talk about sharing, nor of exchanging. She said bluntly, give them back. I'm sure you're all aware of social media today. Education, schools, universities have the web as their first port of call. The web, whether we like it or not, is the main source of information, be it for schools and scholars, tourists, or just the curious. People go by the web today, and this is where we should make the difference. Our task should focus on spreading the truth about theft and illegality, or if you prefer, as Hitchens once wrote, there is in one of the museum's priceless acquisitions a repressed and guilty secret, which has been covered, say I, by dust and hypocrisy since 197 years. Well, it's time to take the dust away. Lord Edgen did not salvage the marbles to bring ancient Greek art to the British people and protect the sculptures from further damage. He wanted them for his house in Scotland. No original Fairman has ever been found, and what was stated in the second Fairman Elena Korka told you a minute ago about, certainly does not allow the dismembering of one of the greatest monuments of antiquity. There is no merit in the division of the marbles, and yes, there was a destruction, and yes, there is a new museum today, a beautiful state-of-the-arts museum, the new Acropolis Museum, that was built specially to house the marbles. These are ecumenical facts that reveal the truth about the marbles. The British Museum has succeeded so far to alter the meaning of the words so as to defend its case, and our task should be together and in collaboration with the Greek government to bring the real story to the front page by exposing the truth, mainly through the media, but also through education, museums, through a strong public support, through a political will, because deep down we know that when people are aware, they are supportive. And we know that sooner or later, there will be an overwhelming moral appeal in Britain if we work well, that will eventually force the trustees of the British Museum to change attitude. And instead of being defensive or diplomatically omitting the truth or making a virtue of the separation of the sculptures, they will be forced to return the sculptures to Athens. But that is provided we work. I often refer to what Colin, uh, uh, novelist Colin McInnes once wrote about the return of the Greek marbles back in the 1960s. Quote, Individuals make disinterested gestures rarely enough, and nations almost never. Yet, I have such an irrational faith in the ultimate decency of my fellow countrymen that I cannot believe them forever incapable of doing the right, the apt thing. The British Museum and its people have worked thoroughly and meticulously for years to spread their part of the story to the public to defend the looting and the illegality of the marbles in Britain, and it is now our task to reveal to public opinion how the British Museum omitted or refrained from telling the truth, so as to achieve its goal. And what you will see in this brief presentation coming up now is just a mere example of these omissions. Museums nowadays have to speak the truth. They have to abide to principles and values that reflect human rights, ethics and morality. And this is not the feeling I had when I entered the webpage of the British Museum. As I read through the lines of the website, my anger grew even stronger as I realized that the British Museum, an internationally acknowledged scientific institution, not only houses the produce of an illegal act, but continues publicly to provoke world civilization with arrogance and self-produced misconceptions that alter the facts and consequent history. The part of the British Museum website, which I will now show you, 
If you Google Parthenon marbles, it's a British museum that shows up, not Athens, not the new Acropolis Museum, and not classical Greece. And this has been checked out by me practically every day since the beginning of November to see whether there's any change or whether I have omitted realizing things. But this, uh, these um, photographs come from uh, two or three days ago. So, the part of the British, the part of the website of the British Museum that concerns the Parthenon marble is very well constructed and consists of four major issues. The statement by the trustees, facts and figures, the issue of the 1930s cleaning and video. The website has not been updated since the opening of the New Acropolis Museum, and no reference to its existence is made. The spirit that runs through the context of the website cannot be otherwise explained but defensive. This is obviously the result of an ill feeling of the trustees versus a common feeling of justice of the British people. The trustees feel the need to defend their views about the legitimacy and the ownership of the Parthenon sculptures. And it is indeed a very difficult task to defend the dissecting of a monument that is considered the symbol of Western civilization. Fiona Rose Greenland says again concerning the Parthenon under a wonderful paragraph named, quote, moving the immovable from the Athenian Acropolis to Elgin's London shed. She says, in spite of his later claim that he acted in order to bring ancient Greek art to the British people and protect the sculptures from further damage, it is clear from Elgin's private letters that he intended to send them back to his home in Scotland. Let us now have a closer look at the points of the website that need to be addressed and answered on behalf of the Greek government, or by us, the different national committees worldwide that have been created so as to help the Greek government. This is the first page you see of the position of the trustees of the British Museum. I copy what they write. The trustees are convinced that the current division allows different and complementary stories to be told about surviving sculptures, highlighting their significance within world culture and affirming the place of ancient Greece among the great cultures of the world. I am sure that we, all of us, can prove that this is utterly false. At the entrance of room number 18, you read, the Parthenon sculptures in the British Museum were brought to England by Lord Elgin and bought by the museum. A few examples. And I like Henry Porter saying, it is also thanks to Elgin that generations of visitors have been able to see the sculptures at eye level rather than high up. And of course, you can read what Porter said in two or three. Now, the collection is amongst a larger collection, much larger than what we think, because uh, Luzieri and the people from Elgin collected from all over Greece parts and bits and pieces. So the museum quotes, the, the website says, uh, not to mention other sculpture and inscriptions acquired from either sides of both of the agency. The most curious is a colossal Egyptian scarab beetle in granite. We're talking about the Parthenon sculptures and their importance to the British Museum. Now we know that there are parts of, of um, the, the frieze and the sculptures in other museums, but some other museums have given them back. This is nowhere to be found in the website of the British Museum. How many are in Athens? Today, 45% are in Athens, 50% are in London, and scattered around the world are 5%. And it's not only us, says the web. Look at all the other museums that have. So it's, it's a way of putting things that when somebody that has not the particular interest we have, but a scholar or a student looks into this, they say, oh, it's not only the British Museum that has these, other museums have them. And then, of course, there are the famous letters and the salvaging of the, of the, the sculptures. Well, we have uh, notes of Elgin 
letters saying, please, I wish to collect as much as mar marble as possible. It's not works of art to him, it's marbles. The legal statutes, I'm sure that more uh, knowledgeable people, just like we heard this morning, can uh, come, uh, give answers uh, and we can ask and really uh, explain what the so-called Furman says, qualche pezzi di pedra, some pieces of stone. They do not refer to dismembering the whole issue. The cleaning, a huge issue. Oh, we can look into that. It is now scientifically admitted. William Sinclair says how this happened because it was nicely covered up up to uh, uh, when St. Clair um, found this out. They want to promote philellenism in Britain and which is a wonderful quote. The sculptures from the Parthenon now in the British Museum have been in London longer than the modern state of Greece has been in existence. Two different issues. Two different things completely. We have them since 2,500 years. They've had them 197, but they, they bring in something completely different. We're not talking of a Greek state when these uh, sculptures were taken away. Oh, this is also lovely. The access to the Parthenon sculptures, and of course, where there should be a center for the Parthenon studies. Is it, is it, what's logical? Where should be a center for Parthenon studies? in Athens or in London. We can go on and look into this, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, think of what uh, the New Acropolis Museum has to offer. And I would like to end by giving a proposition, an honest proposition. However much we want things to move on and change, this will not happen overnight. The return of the Parthenon marbles to Athens will be an ongoing issue for the years to come. The Greek government is entering a new mediation progress, pro process under the auspices of UNESCO, and I would wish them every success. But in the meantime, we can help. There is a lot of us here today, and we share the same goal. There are so many ways to go about the issue, and I'm so glad that Russell spoke before me. Serious funding, of course, has to be done, and short and long-term campaigns should be planned meticulously, both in Europe and in the rest of the world. But there is something simple we can do right away, something that will have an effect on millions of people as they search to find the story of the Parthenon marbles on the web. You have witnessed today how the British Museum informs the world of the issue. It is offensive, arrogant and it is misleading. An official request could be sent to the trustees of the British Museum, copied to world media, asking them to correct and amend what is given out to the public through their website. There are a lot of us who possess the knowledge here present today and a lot everywhere in all the committees that exist in the world. We know, possess, and cherish the truth about the dismembering of the sculptures, about the ferment, about the destruction, about the separation, about the illegality, and above all, about the new Acropolis Museum. We have to tell the world that other museums have returned the valuable treasures to the Parthenon and to the new Acropolis Museum. The British Museum has also returned to Australia items that were very valuable to them. Corrections and amendments can be made in good faith. And as the web page of the British Museum places emphasis on the good relations between the scientists of the British Museum and the Greek counterparts, let us take up their challenge. Thank you very much.